I'm going to be talking today about the gene therapy and genome editing. So as we heard before from the seminar presented by Juan Bueren, there are different types of gene therapies, in particular in vivo and ex vivo, and there are many different vectors and different strategies. But what I would like to focus today in this seminar is in these other genome editing tools, CRISPR, which are obviously everywhere, particularly since uh, the beginning of October, these two researchers, Emmanuel Charpentier in the left and Jennifer Downer on the right, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for this year for the development of a method for genome editing. Their discoveries were based on the previous research done by many different researchers particularly in bacteria, in microorganisms such as bacteria and archaea. And this is uh, this person I would like to highlight, Francisco Juan Martinez Mojica, Francis Mojica, microbiologist from the University of Alicante. And he was the one starting to realize about this peculiar organization of the genomes of these microorganisms. And he was uh, naming these repeats as CRISPR, which is the word that is being used elsewhere. Now we know that uh, thanks to Francis Mojica research that what it is in between these repeti repetitions, there are pieces of the viral genomes and those bacteria that are carrying these pieces, they are immune to the infection for these particular viruses. So this is a true immune defense system of a genetics basis. This uh, defense system that is operating in prokaryotes can be converted into a genome editing tool in eukaryotes. And this is something that has occurred over 20 years of research from 1993. That's when Francis started uh, characterizing the system using these archaeas of the sal ponds near Alicante in Santa Pola to 2013 with these four geneticists, uh, Feng Zhang, George Church, uh, Jenny and Young they confirm that they could be used as genome editing tools. This is the original CRISPR-Cas system that was presented by Down and Charpentier in 2012. It is a nuclease, this yellow patch, Cas9 normally, that is cutting DNA in double strand, but it's not cutting everywhere. It's not randomly cutting, but it's guided by this blue molecule. It is an RNA molecule that is pairing to our favorite gene, and it's indicating this nuclease where it has to cut. Nowadays, eight years later, what is mostly used is these ribonuclear particles, RMPs. This is a combination of a protein, recombinant protein, the Cas9, together with two small RNA molecules that all together, they can be purchased. This is all commercially available and can be used for the genome editing experiment. This is about cutting the DNA. And once you cut the DNA in double strand, you need to fix this double strand break, either through non-homologous enjoining, the left pathway in which you can insert or delete randomly the nucleotides until you uh, regenerate some microhomology that can lead to the reconstitution of the physical continuity. But normally, you have to pay a fee for this, and the gene will stop working. You disrupt the gene. This is the easiest way of disrupting a gene. On the other hand, the right pathway, homology-driven repair pathway, you can deliver a template that uh, has homology left and right to the double strand break and can introduce the novel sequence. This is probably the uh, gene addition. You can delete, insert, replace, modify. You can do as many different applications in biology, in biomedicine, and biotechnology. You can disrupt the gene with CRISPR-Cas. You can delete when you combine two of these systems in the same molecule. You can invert a DNA. You can duplicate and do other chromosomal rearrangements. You can promote the incorporation of a given point mutation in a given sequence, in a given gene. You can insert a gene into another. And by that, you can change the fate of that gene function. You can activate a gene by combining a nuclease that no longer cuts but still can be located in a place in the genome and you can add an activating domain or you can have a repression domain so you can inactivate a gene. You can base edit a gene by combining an activity, in this case, the deaminase that can change a C into a D or an A 
into a G. And the last of the versions that we have known about this CRISPR-Cas system is prime editing, in which a reverse transcriptase is used to be bound with an E-case that is cutting only one strand of DNA, and it's promoting the conversion of nucleotides in the opposite strand. Besides the capacities, one needs to be aware about the limitation of these CRISPR-Cas9 tools. To begin with, uh, you need to be aware that you can inactivate similar genes because your guide RNA might not be 100% specific to your favorite gene. It might be inactivating other genes that you don't want to touch. And these are the so-called off-target effects. You can reduce this by bioinformatics, selecting the best guides possible. Real problem is the on-target effects of so the most ICs in which the default pathway, which is the left pathway in which you are adding and removing nucleotides, it's progressing randomly. And this is generating multiple genetical variants, multiple alleles among which you will find your desired allele. For instance, this is an experiment in which each line is a different mouse. These are mice that have been edited and among which they will be the one you are interested in, but there will be many others you are not interested. This is really the limitation that you have to take into account. Of course, this can be dealt with relatively well. It can be managed in the academia because all the mice that you are producing are mosaic. You can detect those that are carrying the desired mutations. You can set up the corresponding mating and in the next generation, hopefully the mutation will be segregating and you will find the one that is carrying the mutation you are interested. You can do this with animals, you can do this with G cells, with plants, but you cannot do this with patients. This is a, a formal limitation in the clinical application of these techniques. This is why you have meiosis in the animals. Of course, in cells, in, in culture, you don't have meiosis, you have only mitosis. And then there is no other option. You have to scan through many different clones until you come across the one that is carrying only the mutation you have been planning and discard all the other clones. Sometimes this variability, it is of relevance. When Werem is also talking about the Fanconi anemia rare disease, in which case this is affecting genes that are affecting the repair DNA mechanism in the stem hematopoietic uh, pluripotent stem cells. And in this case, when you are do, doing uh, genome editing and you apply the non-homologous enjoining, this variability in some time generate correct alleles. And these correct alleles, they have a proliferation advantage, which can take over and replace the rest of the different clones. So in some times, this variability in ex vivo situation can have a therapeutic benefit. So it is clear that CRISPR-Cas, it is the future, particularly for human gene therapy, besides all the applications in biology or biotechnology. By gene therapy, it means we can promote a cut of the DNA near the mutation. We can provide a template and we can hope that the repair mechanism will be replacing the template by the original mutation and by that you will be correcting, you will be curing that gene. This is the gene therapy applied with CRISPR. Of course, they are legal and illegal because germline gene therapy you cannot do. Some countries such as Spain, this is illegal because we, are, we have signed the Asturias Convention in 1997. Further than this is uh, questionable from the point of view of ethics. And also we have seen that it's not uh, wise to be using these techniques because we cannot uh, predict this uncertainty. It's su suggesting us not to use, whereas application of gene therapy in somatic cells in vivo and ex vivo is legal and it's acceptable. Of course, there were people that did not pay attention to this. And He Jiang Kui in November 2018, he decided to edit human embryos, something that we can do in Spain, as long as we don't implant these embryos. He implanted these embryos in women and that led to the birth of three girls, uh, to um, uh, three girls that were gene edited. And this was the first time that a uh, human being has been edited. This is an experiment that should have been taking place because uh, we cannot uh, predict what would be the outcome. This uncertainty, it is an irresponsibility. That's why he ended up uh, um, uh, condemned in prison for three years with a very important fine and inhabilitated for life. 
recently, this summer, we have known that uh, the alterations in the human embryos are very similar to the alterations that we see in the mouse embryo. So why shouldn't be different? So they are not different. Now we know we have the scientific proofs. This is recommending not to use this technique. Besides the legality, besides the ethics issues, it is not recommended to use these techniques in human embryos unless we have um, improved the efficacy and the certainty of these modifications. The many clinical trials involving gene therapies, as many as more than 4,500, and out of these many, only 41, they're dealing with CRISPR. So we have 41 clinical trials. Most of them are ex vivo. There's just one of them which is in vivo, and it is presented in this slide, in which uh, this is a treatment for uh, Leber's congenital amaurosis type 10, in which the mutations in the gene affected is the CFP290, and then the CRISPR tools are delivered in the form of adeno-associated viral vectors, intraocularly, intravitrally, and subretinally. The rest of, uh, this is a clinical trial ongoing. The rest of applications are ex vivo, such as those for treating refractory types of cancer, such as myelomas, sarcomas, or melanomas. And this is the cancer immunotherapy in which T cells from the patients are obtained and then in vitro, in the laboratory, CRISPR is applied to inactivate PD-1, which is a negative regulator of the immune system. And CRISPR is also used to remove the endogenous T cell receptor. And this uh, edited T cells are just modified in addition with a lentiviruses that is adding a specific uh, T cell receptor, which is driven and it, is, uh, it, it will be attacking more precisely these cancer cells. This has a lot of future, and this is probably going to be the, the most used at the moment of CRISPR in the clinics, so far in clinical trials. And also for the treatment of sickle cell anemia or beta thalassemia, in which case, in these cases, the hemoglobin has two chains, alpha and beta. The beta is encoded by different genes that are expressed subsequently during development in adults. This is the gene normally mutated. We have a fetal version of the gene that is normally not expressed in adults because it's repressed. But now if we apply uh, CRISPR to deplete the expression of this repressor, if we repress the repressor, we are promoting what is being repressed. And this allows the substitution of this fetal version of the beta globin with the adult uh, uh, beta globin. And this is already a clinical trial that has been successful and people that normally would need maybe several transplants, blood transplants per month in order to survive, they can escape and they can live without this blood transplantation. This is probably another of the successful uses of uh, CRISPR in biomedicine. All these different reagents have been delivered by the adeno-associated viral vectors. And uh, this is something to take into account because these are vectors that they are not integrative as Juan Buren was telling us. And we have different serotypes that are targeting different types of cells and for which they are very useful. The alternative is the use of nanoparticles, nanotechnology, such as the treatment of this ATTDR, which is a rare disease that this company has been testing before in vitro and in animal models. And very recently, this October this year, has been deploying and will be new clinical trials starting in UK. Another aspect that one needs to pay attention is the origin of these nucleases that we're using. We're using Cas9 normally from Streptococcus pyogenes and Staphylococcus aureus. These are two pathogenic bacteria that uh, our immune systems are, very, are well known. Are well known that we know about these uh, bacteria. So Matthew Portius from Stanford here in the picture, he was anticipating that we might have antibodies, we might have T cells against the compounds of these bacteria and against these bacteria themselves. And he was right. Most of us, we carry antibodies and T cells against this. So that would be impossible to use these proteins in a clinical setup because we will trigger an anaphylactic response, which could be detrimental for the patients. And this is why he was not only detecting the problem, but he was also suggesting a solution. A solution could be an immunosuppression 
or maybe the use of alternative CAS. This is important because there are many CRISPR-Cas systems, as many as 50% of the bacteria that are known and those that are not known that we cannot cultivate, they have CRISPR-Cas systems. Most of these CRISPR-Cas systems are not known, they need to be isolated, and as many as 80% of the archaea, they have also CRISPR-Cas system. Out of which, for instance, Jennifer Down now was uh, presenting this, uh, this work in which new CRISPR-Cas systems were presented from uh, microbes in which you cannot cultivate. So you do metagenomics analysis and some Cas were found that they are much smaller, so therefore they could be more beneficial from the therapeutical point of view. And last but not least, this CRISPR-Cas fee is probably the last of these uh, innovative uh, Cas versions that have been obtained by Jennifer Downer, in which in July this year, he was detecting this Cas fee in huge phages. These are viruses that are infecting bacteria and are using this CRISPR-Cas to attack other viruses that might be infecting the same bacteria. So they are competing for the same bacteria. This Cas will have less than 1,000 amino acids, whereas normally Cas9 has 1,400 amino acids. It is a huge protein, and this Cas fee, they're much uh, smaller, and they can be used more preferentially for gene therapy developments. So let me finish up by just saying that CRISPR-Cas is a method that has come to stay. I just described briefly the applications in the biomedicine field, but there are applications in biology and in biotechnology, both animal and vegetal and in plant biotechnology, also for controlling the plagues by mosquitoes, also by even uh, 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 just uh, bringing to life species that have been extinct, like, like the holy mammoth, at this, as it is uh, illustrated in this picture. There, so there are many applications beyond biomedicine, particularly CRISPR-Cas tools, definitely they are the next generation of uh, gene editing approaches. So we will see many of these strategies will be deployed and being used in the forthcoming years. So let me finish up by just thanking my group and all the different institutions and foundation that are providing us some funds to do our experiments. I thank you for your attention.